Okay, good morning, everyone. It's 2.30 in KL. It is 6.30 a.m. in London, and I hope you're all well. Um, I hope you found the session yesterday useful. Um, if you didn't manage to make it, it is on recording, but as all of you who were here live know, it's far better attending a live session because we can um, ask questions, we can interact, we can ask anything we want. And it's the same today. So how, how are we all today? Are we all good? Hello, Brenda. Hello, Faraton. Hello, Heidel. Good afternoon, Atika. Linny, good afternoon. Mafuz, hello. Um, kind now, just... Um, Kine, can you when, uh, just let me, um, I'll, I'll come back to last session structure, but before we start, some house rules. Yep. If you have any questions for me, make sure in the chat box, you send your messages, not to all panelists, but to all panelists and attendees. I think kind only I would see your message, whereas uh, it would be nice for everyone to see your message. Diana to all panelists and attendees. Yep, all panelists and attendees. If you can do that, that's great. Also, uh, any any qu no questions are off limits, and you can ask me any question you want. Okay, okay. Um, let me see, what about the rest of the participants? So we've got quite a few people here. Um, maybe not all of us are able to communicate, but uh, that doesn't matter. Um, but I would like you to. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say good morning again, and how are you doing? Okay, Kine, you've got that correct now. John? I, I'm missing uh, yesterday's session. Um, I think there'll be a recording, John. Um, you're here today, so that's the main thing, but live is always best on these sessions, always. Uh, I think we gave you about three weeks notice, so maybe you're a really busy man, John, and your diary was absolutely full for the next three weeks when we sent the invitation. Ed, John, good morning, good morning. Um, okay, okay. There's some house rules. I just want to talk about um, the session structure. And in the session structure, um, I'm going to talk about how you can give yourself the best chance to pass SPL. I'm going to talk about how SPL is marked. I'm going to review a couple of SPL questions. And I'm going to tell you what you need to do in the next few weeks. So, um, that's what we're going to do for the next two hours. Um, in, I don't think I really said anything about me to you last time, did I? Um, my name's Sean Purcell. I've been teaching for more than 25 years. Uh, I'm the ACCA SBL um, tutor guru, which means I act as a kind of um, uh, an expert to run training sessions on SBL mainly for SBL tutors, but sometimes I'm lucky enough to get an opportunity to meet lovely uh, students like you. Um, and I've, um, yeah, I've been coming to Malaysia for whoa, since the mid nineties. Yep, so a long time, a long time. And uh, I know your country very well. And my whole purpose of this session is to make sure as many people as possible pass the exam. I have lots of experience um, with, you know, marking exam papers and working with the ACCA and um, examining teams and sitting on all the examiner sessions over the years. So please, please, my information is all based on lots of experience and fact. So um, yeah, that's what I. That's me. That's how I uh, can be credible to give you the advice. Now, it's, you know, just over three weeks till we're doing our exam. And one thing that we all must make sure that we do um, 
is full exam practice. OK, so we're, we're probably moving into our um, revision um, stage uh, or moving towards it. it. And it's critical. People say, oh, I read a chapter every night. Well, OK, um, th this exam is not requiring you to read a chapter. Yep. Um, we, it's an integrated exam, as I mentioned yesterday, um, and it's integrating professional and technical skills. And the best way you can do this is via question practice. Yep. And really, I'm only interested in you doing question practice with questions that are X exam questions available on the ACCA exam site. Or you can uh, maybe have official ACCA material, which is only from Kaplan or BPP, and they have questions in there. And um, yeah, there's some non-exam questions in those Kaplan and BPP kits, but they're quite good to build up your confidence and to make you aware of uh, the key areas. But what's vital is you spend quite a bit of time over the next few weeks doing exams to time. Yep, really important. Yep, so I can't stress that enough. Um, in terms of, sorry, we just, we've gone through that, haven't we? Um, in terms of doing a mock exam to time, well, how many of us out of interest have done a mock exam to time so far? Nobody. So we've got quite a few. You've tried it once. Lemon's tried it once. Uh, Farrington hasn't tried it. Uh, um, Mafuz has done it once, once. Jansen once, haven't. Beatrice tried it once. Uh, yet to re that, reach that stage. So most of us only tried it once. Um, OK, the, ne the next question I would ask you does anyone drive a car here? Let me know if anyone drives a car. Can anyone drive? Yep. Lee, we, uh, Kai, Mafuz, Beatrice, Edjun. Whoa, we all drive cars. Fantastic. Now, in Malaysia, do you have to pass a driving test? Of course you do. Of course you do. And before your driving test, did you get in a car once? Or did you get in a car and practice more than once? Farrington only did it five times. My goodness. <laughs> That's a bit worrying that you passed your test after five times in a car. My point is one just to make you think, of course, you did it more than once. OK, of course, you did it more than once yet. Um, because you know the more practice you do, the better you will get. If you only do a mock exam once, you will have about as much chance of passing as you would if you get in a car only once. OK, the exam is a practical exam which requires application of your knowledge. And um, this is a quote from your examining team. And basically, sitting a mock exam in the time allocated without reference to study materials is the single most important thing to pass the ACCA exam and prepare for it. OK, we, we have to go through this process to to understand uh, certainly the dynamics of timing. If, if you've not been through it in four hours, you, you're going to realize that, oh, my goodness, Timing is so important. Yep. Also, some people just afraid, procrastinate, don't do it. The whole point of doing it is to make mistakes, but then to learn from those mistakes, to reflect on the experience. The other thing that's really important, and if you're doing this with a tuition provider, is, is to get some proper marked feedback on your mocks. Yeah, really important. How do you know? how you are progressing if you don't get marked feedback. 
Yep. I run um, a, a kind of online uh, course and I would even on a course like that, um, I, on a revision, I would mark four, five, six uh, more um, and give feedback. So it's really important that you get your tutors to do that for you, because how do you know how how well you're doing? How do you know how to focus? So, yeah, in the all the advice I've given to you and will give to you about how to pass an exam needs to be then uh, practiced in terms of um, putting it into place. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, really important. The other thing that's really important. Um, just to say on timing is is you, you will never know about the importance of timing till you mess up. Yep. Um, the fear factor on here, students don't do a mock because they think if they fail a mock, it will be a predictor of their performance. Well, that's rubbish. It's an opportunity um, to do well. Um, also, the only way you can bring all your exam technique together is to do a mock. Yep. Um, yep. It's yeah, it's tough, but that's what we have to go through and that's what we have to learn. And then after we sit it, we should reflect on our experience. What can we do better next time? Were we time pressured? Did we not say enough? Uh, you know, what was our problem? And really, really try to get it marked. Maybe someone who, who's passed the exam before, maybe a study buddy. Or, or maybe your tutor, but you need to get some way of getting your scripts marked. Yeah, it will give you feedback on how you're doing. And um, but, but, but yeah, it's, it's really important that it gets marked. And the, one of the challenges, I think, of SBL is it's not one and one equals two. So it, you really need to get someone who knows what they're doing to give you some uh, well, to give you the best marked feedback. So, so think about that. OK, the other thing that's really important is have you uh, I mean, just out of interest, what what proportion of us are uh, I, I lose track because of lockdown and um, exam centers having issues. Um, increasingly, you should be prepared going forward for exams to be um, of, of a computer based format. What format are you taking your SBL exam in? So quite a few are paper-based, a few CBE. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, so do, that's interesting. So do you have a choice in Malaysia whether you do CBE or paper? Quite a few CBE now. No, you don't have a choice. Okay, certain states. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, okay. Well, um, your yeah, I, I mean, if you're doing it on CBE, it's really important. The ACCA have invested lots of effort and time and resource in helping you become fully familiar with the CBE platform. There are practice space areas for you to get familiar with it. Please, if you're doing CBE, um, you need you need to get on there. Yep. Um, and I think it's it, but if, if it's been kind of uh, thrust on you because of COVID, uh, the ACCA realized that. And, and I, I, th I mean, that is the future. Um, would it be easier for CBE? Well, June, that's probably a bit of a loaded question. Um, it depends on your handwriting. What I like, I mean, first of all, you have to get familiarity with it. But once you have got familiarity with it, um, I like the fact that you can insert lines and um, you, you, you know, you, you kind of do your plan and then you insert a line and that's an articulated sentence. So I, I personally, it's uh, I prefer it. I think the future, if we look a year or two down the line, we will all be doing CBE. The exam is supposed to be workplace related. And in the workplace, we uh, use word processing. We use spreadsheets. So it will definitely be all CBE. It just makes more sense. And I think COVID has accelerated the adoption of CBE. So is it easier? I think it's more professional, but um, 
you, you know, paper-based exams have worked for a long time, but I think uh, the ACCA maybe has received criticism um, from some of its uh, employers to say, we're getting qualified accountants who can't use or have no idea about word processing and spreadsheet functionality. So part of the CBE experience is making you aware of word processing and spreadsheet functionality. So it's not easier, but um, if you're doing it, that, that there's lots of resource on the ACCA website there. So just make sure uh, you're okay at that. Um, just so you understand, um, the SBL exam and realize that, you know, there are, there's not one answer to the questions. I think the best way for you to understand this is to maybe understand how ACCA exams are marked and understand the marking principles of SBL. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about professionalism and professional skills marks. But again, there's lots of information available on the ACCA website on this. OK, so. Um, what we're going to do is uh, go through each of these. So the first thing um, I want to look at would be who are the marking team? not what are their names, but how does it get made up? Yeah, so what we see here is, um, I just want to explain to you that, that marking is not an exact science. And the purpose of this is to show you um, how it's marked so you get a better understanding how your SBL script will be marked. Yeah, so what we have at the top here we have a marking session lead, yep. And um, because the exams are taken four times a year now, um, I've just got Sandy, one, two, three. I'm not quite sure what you mean by one, two, three, Sandy. Um, but just going, there's, there's a marking session lead. And that, for, you know, in other words, that's probably the examiner of that session. So there's an examining team. The same examiner does not write every single exam. It's now written by a team with one of the examining team leading the session. Yep. Um, so what happens is they will create an exam and there will then be a marking meeting. Yep. Below the exam session lead will be team leaders. Yeah, the numbers of markers was quite large. And to maintain standards, they've got team leaders in each marking team. And these team leaders are experienced markers. They've got proven ability as a marker. And they've also got the appropriate people skills to kind of coach people to make sure they perform to the correct standard. Yep, and each of these team leaders here will probably have about 10 markers below them. Yep, so that's the structure. And then there's also, um, so these, these people are employed by the ACCA on, on a kind of uh, an exam by exam basis. And then there's someone who is the technical advisor for the ACCA who also sits in on the session. Yep, so that's the marking team. That's how it works. Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. What then happens is you do your exam and the exams, if there were a paper-based exam, um, will all be scanned and they will all be accessible to the marking and the examining team. Yep. So what will happen to set the initial standard because on a, an advanced paper like SPL, it, it, the, the level of answers are going to be much richer and more complex than something at applied skills level. Yeah, so there isn't one answer. There's a number of answers which would be given credit. So what the marking session lead will do, they will select a sample of maybe six to eight scripts, which they will then mark, okay? And every team leader, um, 
will will do the same. And typically, the scripts that the marking session lead selects will be, you know, good, average, less good. And each of the markers will mark independently, um, and they use an online marking system. Um, and then um, the marking session lead can look at where each of the markers gave marks. Yeah. And then what happens is the marking session lead and the, the team leaders will all come together and discuss where they gave marks. Yeah. So there will be some disagreement and they sit down and, you know, spend quite a long time discussing um, where they think marks should be given. And once they've agreed, and this can sometimes take hours, a, um, a draft marking guide will be finalized. Yep. So that takes quite a long time. Uh, and, and so we, we've, we've then, from that draft marking guide, create um, a practice and standardization script. Okay. So the, the, the marking leads create a, so it's quite, it's quite complicated that, but uh, so exams, you sit the exam, they're submitted, there is a sample of examination scripts taken of the sample is probably, you know, um, very good, average, not so good. And then the marking leaders all mark those scripts without any marking guide and decide how many marks they will give it. And then they might not all give exactly the same marks. And then they discuss and sit down for a few hours on where really marks should be awarded for different types of answers and that is then all agreed once it's all agreed we create what's called a practice and standardization script and what is a practice and standardization script well um, this is a script which all the markers then have to mark okay and um, what, what happens here is a marker must attempt a practice and standardization script um, and, and do a market. And then they will, um, they'll have a marking guide and, and, and then they'll, they'll mark it with the marking guide. And then they can turn on the definitive marks and they can see how they did to the definitive marks. And they go through a number of these scripts until they feel that their marking standard is, is high. And then they'll be given three um, blank scripts that they need to mark, and they must mark those within less than 5% of the standard marks, or else they will not be allowed to be cleared to mark real scripts. Yeah, so it's quite thorough, the training. Every time, no matter how many times you've been a marker, that is the process the markers go through. Yeah. And it doesn't just stop there. Once the markers are allowed to be live and um, you know be launched on student scripts, um, there would then be um, every few scripts a hidden or, or a script that isn't actually a student script, but it's a seeding script. Yep. So there will be marked scripts. Uh, some scripts will have been marked in advance, and then these scripts will be slotted into a marker's um, pile of marking, which will all be electronically. And it will be there to check that the marker is maintaining the standard which they proved they could achieve when going through the training process. And if it's found that a seeding script is quite a bit different to what the standard mark should be, the marker will be stopped from marking and have to go through retraining until they get it right again. Yep, so if there's any drift, uh, the team leader will step in and this will be an ongoing process uh, to make sure that the marking standard is maintained all the way through. Yep, so hopefully that reassures you of the quality of the processes involved in marking. Yep. And if you are thinking, oh, uh, you know, can I get it remarked? I got 48 or, um, you know, um, 48, it would, a script would have been looked at many times by the markers. And it would normally be that you didn't get your timing right and you just did not write enough. Yep. So 
um, yeah, um, we've got to practice. We've got to practice. I can't stress it enough, uh, the need for practice. So quite a detailed um, overview of the marking. Got no questions, so I'm assuming you are OK with that. Um, let me now talk to you about the basic principles of marking. OK, and what you need to remember is if you look at past exams and you see suggested answers uh, that are published, they are just that. Yeah, but suggested answers are very high scoring answers. Yep, um, they're not really um, what would be expected from you. And I think sometimes they're not always presented in the most marker friendly way. Uh, they're there to help with tutors in future teaching. Um, there are, of course, many different ways in which you can answer and there is suggested answers are not the only answer. Yeah. So appreciate that. And uh, credit is going to be given for any relevant answer. OK, so markers, because they're experienced and they know what they're doing, they are empowered to give credit for any relevant answer. And you as a student, you need to make sure that the way you communicate to the markers is a way which helps them mark your script. Really important. Yeah. And also be aware that there is no negative marking. Yeah. Sometimes students worry about negative marking. There is no negative marking. A point that is technically incorrect just won't get any marks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're not going to get any minus marks. And also students sometimes worry that they're going to get penalized for poor spelling or grammar. Um, no, that's not the case. And markers will give full credit for points which might have some mistakes in written English. As long as the meaning's clear and the overall tone is appropriate, then that's absolutely fine. OK, so hopefully that reassures you. Um, No questions. Are we OK? So with regards to how SBL is marked and how the marking team work, do you have any questions on that? That's quite important. They are the people that are going to determine. Well, you're the person that's going to determine whether you pass or fail. But exam technique is important and I can give you lots of insight into the markers and the examining team. No, Madeline says, does poor spelling? No, um, it's an international exam. Some people are taking it in their fourth language. So the ACCA recognize that. And as I say on the slide, no marks for poor spelling. Yeah. But business writing skills are definitely improved if you regularly read business English. I think we talked about this yesterday, didn't we? So if you can read business English, that's definitely going to improve your um, skills there. Um, when I say suggested answers, like giving a lot of examples, is the answers, is it? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Mafuz. Um, it's not giving a lot of examples. It's um, interpreting and synthesizing the information in the case in accordance with what the task asks. Um, sometimes if your points are a little bit vague, an example is a good idea, but you don't need to give lots of examples in the answers. But I, I think giving examples is a good idea if that's what you mean. How will an answer be considered a good answer by the markers? Well, a good answer will answer the question asked. It will follow the verb. It will address um, in, in an appropriate way, you know, uh, what, what, what is the context of it? What's it asking you to do? A good answer will also be reflective of the marking scheme. Yeah. So John says, I've seen many of my friends who aren't fluent in English pass the marker based on how well you explain and the flow. Of course, John, yes. Um, and I'm very impressed that you can answer any, I certainly couldn't answer an exam in 
um, Chinese or whatever language one speaks or Bahasa Malay. Um, I mean, what else we got? What kind of interpretation to get marks for com comparison ratio from what kind of interpretation? Well, you, you, when you're looking at a ratio, um, you're not going to get marks for calculation of a ratio on SPL. It's a professional level exam. In the workplace, nobody is going to promote you because you can work out a ratio. It's done by a computer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not bothered if you can work out ratios, if I'm honest. I'm bothered if you understand the meaning of ratios and if you can see that there's a shift in gearing, there's a shift in creditor days. What, what, what would the shift in gearing do? It would increase risk. What would a shift in creditor and debtor days do? It could reflect on working capital management. Yeah. And um, but, you, you know, what, what is the trend and what, you know, do you draw from that trend if, you know, it's taking longer to collect cash? Why? Um, if giving real life examples, will that be considered in marks? Um, not really. It's about answering the questions, but sometimes to explain what you are trying to say if you feel your point is getting a bit waffly a real life example is not a bad thing to do but i wouldn't be expecting you to do a real life example on every single answer um kai would an answer outside the suggested answer be okay well i'll just draw your attention to the second point i've put on the slide Credit can be given for any relevant answer. OK, so yes to your question. So as far as no proper answers is concerned, how the markers determine it would be an incorrect answer that they don't give credit for? Well, because um, there's a very clear marking guide which the markers follow. Yeah. And a, an, an, question, an answer which does not answer the question is one which will not get any marks. OK. Um, what is the highest possible mark? Uh, well, does it matter, Sue? What matters is you get over 50. Yeah. Anything over 50, wasted energy. Yeah. You need to be steady in your answer to do all of the exam. Yeah. I said to you yesterday, poor timing is the major reason for failure. Um, will marks be given if using the wrong framework? Madeline, on this exam, if you were listening yesterday, there is no requirement for framework. I'm going to look at specimen one, and it did mention about a model. But if you look at pretty much every other SBL past exam, there is never a request of using a specific framework. A framework, be it Pestel or Five Forces, is there to help structure your thoughts. Yep. It is just there to do that. It's a great way to structure your thoughts, but it is not going to be awarded any marks for a mention of the framework. You wouldn't do that in the workplace, and it would almost be considered a little unprofessional. Tim, you, you need to, well, I'll talk about that in a moment, but Tim, it, we're three weeks away from the exam. You, you really need to know how long you need to write to get one mark, okay? Um, you're taking your driving test. You need to know that to turn left, the indicator goes down. You, to go right, the indicator goes up. And you press the accelerator to go faster. You press the brake to go and to go slower. Yeah, it's really important to be practicing. You cannot go into your driving test with not knowing how the brakes, accelerator, and indicators work. So you've got, uh, I'll, I'll go through the mark, but it's really important that we do this, Tim. Does the examiner prefer a long explanation with flow? I think it to, um, uh, to answer the question, I would encourage you, well, let me say how, how marks are awarded. Um, basic marking principles, you're going to get one or two marks per relevant point. OK. Um, so, you, you know, if there was a 10 mark, you you need probably uh, it depends on how much time you've got, but you need five or six, um, one mark or more. Yep. You could some points if you, 
follow through. The good tip to follow through to get two marks is always say why. So you make your point as required in the answer and then you say why, why, why. Yep. Um, there's a question from Casey. Can we copy the points we identify in the exhibit into our answers? Well, you're not synthesizing the information if you just copy it. What you need to, what SBL is about, is you taking on the information, you thinking about that information, and you drawing some conclusion from that information. That's called synthesis. Yeah. Brenda says there are students who get marginal fail 48, 49. What do you think that would determine the markers of not credit on the one to two marks? It's not one to two marks, Brenda. What tends to happen there is that student doesn't answer all 100 marks of the exam. Yep. And what they do, they might answer only 70 percent of the exam because they don't manage their time. So what they actually do quite well is they get 48 out of 70. But unfortunately, that is not sufficient to pass. The benchmark is over 50. So if they managed their time and they got 50 percent and moved on and, you know, once the time is up on a question, you must move on. If you don't move on, you will be likely to get, you know, 40 to 48 because that's actually 48 out of 70 in a percentage term is quite a good score but you need to answer 100 percent of the marks so that's the reason most people get in the 40s um is there are all are all answers must include point con um i mean that is a technique they they not must include they may must answer um uh the the question and if, if you if you talk about, you know, the consequence and what needs to be done, that's not a bad technique, is it? Uh, Ada, can we combine two points in one paragraph? Um, you can do, but it, it's not, um, the exam is not about being brief and succinct. The exam is about creating opportunities for you to get marks. So I would question, Ida, why do you want to combine two points in a paragraph? Psychologically, those points might get missed, whereas if you have them in two clearly separated subheading mini paragraphs um, that would be more likely to get marks. So I wouldn't be combining points. I would be separating to make it very clear to the marker. Here's a point with a follow through consequence, what needs to be done or, or a why that would be the best way of doing it. June, is it possible to conclude that as long as we try to attempt all questions, although each question we've done half, it's more probable, most definitely, John, you're listening to me, most definitely. Um, you, you must attempt all questions to give yourself most chance. Unfortunately, a lot of people do not manage their time. They, you feel like, oh, I can say more. Of course you can say more. Of course you can say more. I might see if I can um, hook up... Um, and share my screen with you on an animation to show you a little bit more. Um, but, but yes, some great questions on, on marking there. Um, and, and thank you for those. Um, Nicole says, can a, uh, an answer be written in point form? Well, what do you think? I'll put that back to the audience. Would that be professional? Yep, it's written in point form. Um, so, Nicole, I'm going to put that back to the audience, see whether the audience think it would be accessible, uh, acceptable to write an answer in bullet point form. Angela, what if we do 70% of the question, balance 30% if we don't know how to do? It's not we don't want to attempt. Angela, you've got to practice questions to get confident. I would say sometimes 30% of uh, the questions will be really relying on you to give an opinion. There's no, you could take the book into the exam with you and you wouldn't be able to find the answer in the book. It's about you interpreting and giving an opinion on things. You know, it's a practical exam. KG says it should be in paragraph form. Depends on the format of the question. Okay, Mafuz, that's a fair point. If they ask uh, for a slide, but they will always ask for a slide and accompanying notes. So you would do a bullet point on the slide and then you would do comprehensive notes, which would relate to the slide. Yeah. 
So uh, just going back to your question, um, Nicole, no. Yeah, it's about, uh, I, I mean, you know, there's two ways. Uh, to me, it's a little bit like Christmas. Would you give a present wrapped up or would you just give it? What would what would have more impact? A present with lovely paper and a ribbon around it, it would appear. So when you get a perfume bottle, do all perfume bottles just come in like test tubes? They all look the same. Or do they come in a nice bottle in a nice design in a nice box? Those that come in a nice bottle with a nice design and a nice box sell for more money because people perceive them to be better. And it's the same way how you put your answers together. Yeah. No problem, Nicole. No problem. And thank you for your question. Um, OK, marking is going to reflect the intellectual level demanded by the task and the uh, task. Your um, strategic professional exam is as an intellectual level three. Um, technical knowledge is good, but technical knowledge needs to be applied in the context of the scenario. Yep. Nor wants to know the difference between a memo and a letter because I'm a bit confused. They look the same. They are pretty much the same, Nor. What is the official format of a report? There isn't one. I said to you yesterday, Malaysian Airlines, Petronas, Malaysian Telecom will not do it exactly the same. But acknowledge the request. If you completely ignore it, that will not be professional. So intellectual levels. There's something called Bloom's taxonomy. And in Bloom's taxonomy, um, there's six levels of capabilities and the ACCA syllabus uses the three levels uh, to determine learning outcomes. So right down at the bottom, you've got your applied knowledge exams and uh, they're kind of level one outcomes. So these ones at the bottom are level one and you just need to comprehend and remember stuff. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of... Um, very easy to put those kind of learning outcomes into a multi-choice kind of um, situation. Level two is the applied skills exams, uh, and they move up a little bit to an analysis and uh, applying. Whereas uh, SBL, it's about evaluating and synthesizing. Yeah, and most of the outcomes on uh, SBL are about evaluation and synthesizing. Yeah, there are some level two outcomes. Um, where analysis and application will be tested, um, but they'll they'll normally form part of a broader evaluation and synthesis kind of outcome. Yep. So you know a case will include exhibits and might include financial uh, data, and that financial data needs to be analysed. Um, however, um, you know you're going to report to the directors providing an evaluation as required in the task. If you just churn out textbook knowledge, you're not going to get many marks. Yep, this is a practical exam. Okay, it's a practical exam. Um, it's not an exam of technical knowledge. The technical knowledge is there to help structure our thoughts, but we need to then think about the requirements and apply them in an appropriate way. OK. All right. Um, so this is the kind of thing that you're going to get asked at level three. You're going to get asked to synthesize and evaluate. Um, so create new ideas or new insights. Um, yeah, you're going to use um, uh, all the information, which will be quite a lot of it and quite complex. And you're able to then bring it together, draw conclusions. Yeah, you're going to use reasoned arguments to infer and make judgment from the information you're going to get. Yeah, you're going to justify and validate your uh, conclusions and recommendations. Yeah, that's a typical level three. So someone was asking me about um, uh, the, the, to do questions. So what I've done is... Um, I've actually got that slide slightly the wrong. It's gone in the wrong way. I, I asked you to have a look at specimen paper one. OK, so if you were if you're interested, I'm sure you all had a look. So well done. Um, if you're not interested, you might want to consider your motivation for passing the exam. But um, specimen paper one did mention this 
an appropriate model. Yep, um, I think most this was so I was involved in SBL two and a half years before the exam was actually taken. So I was involved in writing training and helping tutors uh, practice to how to teach SBL um, and how they can help their students mark questions. So I spent a lot of time. And to begin with, we had specimen one and specimen two uh, written by the examining team. And I think we decided, I mean, so the very first one talked about a model. But I think moving forward, it was decided that really in the workplace, you wouldn't be asked to use a model. But I, I've just picked this one just to to maybe highlight that fact, to, to just manage your expectations and just to show you. Um, yeah, this this doesn't there's not a specific model. You can use any one you want. In fact, it wouldn't even mention model um, and you wouldn't have to use one, but a, a model would be a useful thing to use to structure thoughts. So we've got 15 marks. Yep. If we've got 15 marks, I want to ask you, and some of you were asking me, um, how long are you going to give to a 15 mark question? How many minutes? Thirty-seven. I'm going to have to work that out. Thirty. Okay. Well, two point four six minutes a mark. Um, Fifteen times two point five. Um, thirty-seven. Yeah, thirty-eight. Thirty-seven and a half. Yeah. Okay, 30 Huda. Okay, 30. So some giving two minutes, some giving two and a half. Okay, okay. Um, some not sure. Interesting. Well, for those of us who haven't answered and are not sure, um, it's really important that you are sure because if you're not sure how long you are going to spend answering your question in the exam, you're dead. Yeah because you've got no control. You've got no benchmark. You're really in trouble. And it's fundamental. Um, yeah. Madeline says, can we write all five forces with only one to two points per heading? It's up to you, Madeline. Um, if you feel you can get the mark, it depends on the marking scheme, doesn't it? So it's not about, it's about answering the question asked. Yeah, I'll show you. The exam is four hours, okay? It's 240 minutes, all right? Now, if we've got 240 minutes, I would suggest, and I'm not saying you have to do this, but let's say 40 minutes reading and planning. If you feel you can't do it in that time, you might have to move that up to whatever is necessary, 60 minutes reading and planning, okay? But I'm gonna take 40. So I'm going to take 40 minutes reading and planning. That leaves me with 200 minus 40 minutes, which leaves me with 240 minutes. Sorry, leaves me with 200 minutes. OK, how many marks? Yep. How many marks? Do I divide 200 by? 80. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Why? The 20 professional marks take no time to acquire. Yeah, no time at all. So divide 200 by 80. And it comes to two and a half minutes a mark. And quite a few of you were able to give me that answer. Quite a few of you weren't. I hope all of you now are able to do that when sitting the exam. OK, you have to have control. Yep. So the question here was 15 marks. That equates to 37 and a half minutes. All right. So what you would be doing in the exam, you would be writing the start time. You would then add 37 and a half minutes to that start time and have a finishing time. 
And when that finish time comes up, you leave. OK, if you don't leave at the appropriate time. You've had it. You've got to practice and feel, ah, I can say more. Of course you can say more. Of course you can say more. But you need to get 50 percent of the whole exam. And if you don't give yourself that opportunity, you're going to get into real trouble. Yeah. So what would happen is then I've got my timing. I look at the question and I do a brainstorm. I then do a mark focused plan. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing here. So from the information you've collected, draft a selection of the consultants report to include an analysis of the industry and market which DCS is in. OK, 15 marks. Shabardine says, how much should we expect to write for 15 marks? Well, what would you suggest? I would suggest you need uh, at least eight articulated good points to safe. Maybe let's go for 10. That will get us 10 out of 15 and that will get us a pass. Yeah, there's no absolute words. And often people who are not very good at business writing do lots of words. So if you read business English regularly, your ability to articulate in business English is going to massively improve. So hopefully that helps. But here I've got 15 marks. Um, I'm thinking for a brainstorm, what's the knowledge area? Well, it, it, it's basically the knowledge area here. It's um, talking about an industry and it's talking about a market. So when we're talking about an industry and a market and maybe a model, what, what do I use? What it's asking us what? What knowledge area? Um, well, for me, the knowledge area being asked is that of strategic analysis. OK, and when I'm thinking of strategic analysis, what do I know about strategic analysis? Well, if I think back to my studies on strategic analysis, um, I'm thinking about internal analysis. I'm thinking about external analysis and I'm thinking about key stakeholders. Yeah. So really, industry and market is external and not internal. Agreed. So I'm not going to talk about the EMS model or anything like that in, in structuring my answer plan. I'm thinking about external. And I'm literally thinking about Pestel and I'm thinking about five forces. Which one do I use? It doesn't matter. What matters is you write enough to get the marks. OK, so let's have a look. I've got a few questions as I was talking there. Um, SPL need to answer the question following sequence. Can I leave one page blank to continue another question? Um, you can. It wouldn't be what I'd, I mean. You f follow it in sequence, Crystal, because often um, there, there's, uh, there's a journey. So, you know, once that's done, they go on to the next stage. Um, Lemon says external or internal. Well, industry uh, is, is external, isn't it? Market is external. So I would then have a generic brainstorm of Pestel and Five Forces. And I'm not going to talk about all of them, but now I have something to go on. So what am I going to say about each of these? Well, I'm going to do it slowly for you, but you would be doing this quite quickly. And what I'm going to say, I'm going to think, OK, political. What could I say political? Well, the headquarters in Prydian uh, has a well-developed political system. So what? Well, that makes it, you know, a, not a bad place to do business. So don't just give me the statement, draw a conclusion and infer what that means. Um, in thinking about economic, I come up with like tax, inflation, interest rates and stuff like that. Um, is there any tax thing? I can't see anything, so I'm not going to say anything. On economic, is there anything about interest rates? Well, the one thing that did mention in the scenario was the banks were tightening things up. Uh, and were, you know, putting covenants and stuff. So, yeah, a comment on that. Was the mention of inflation? No, not going to say anything. Was there anything about GDP? Not that I could see, so not really going to say anything. Staging economic cycle. 
Well, the uh, stage was one where it was fairly mature. It was saturated. It was moving into decline. So what? Well, this means that revenue streams and margins are unlikely to grow and probably decline. So we might want to think about, you know, developing other lines of business. And then exchange rates, was there anything there? Well, there's a customer in a neighboring country. Is that affected by exchange rates? If it is, how do we minimize the risk to that exchange rate fluctuation? So you can see there, I've gone through economic thinking of exchange rates, economic cycle, GDP, inflation, interest rates, tax. Um, and I, I've done that quite quickly. Yep. But I've come up with some points. I've addressed the case with some generic ideas and not all of them actually worked. But the fact that I went through got me quite a few points. Yep. But what I didn't do was say, when doing personal analysis, political, political, we have to look at the gov changes in government, changes in government could affect things, e.g. US elections. It's got nothing to do with the scenario. Okay? It's about using these models to extract relevant information. So that's what I do when I look at economic. I just blast through those and you can see, I think I got maybe three point or four. Yeah, three points. I got something about interest rates and banks. I got something about the stage in the cycle and how it was maturing. And I talked a bit about exchange rates. OK, so I want you to do that every time when we're looking at economic tax, interest, inflation, GDP, exchange rates. And in the same way, when I look at social, I go through a similar set of steps. Yeah, so. Uh, was it fashion? What's, what, you know, what's, what's trending? Well, there was maybe the internet trending, which could help DCS in the industry it was in. Was demographics affecting the dynamic of the situation? I don't think so. Lifestyle, there was nothing evidenced. L race, religion, nothing really. Patterns of work and leisure, nothing really I could see. But the fact is, I went through a list in the same way I went through a list in my mind, not on paper. OK, it just helped me think and consider to go fishing for points. Um, in terms of technological stuff, well, in terms of technological stuff here, maybe we could talk about uh, the cloud and, um, you know, the movement towards that and big data. Yeah, the market was looking at that. So make about that, that will provide an opportunity for a company like DCS in the industry which it's in. Ecological, well, there was something about carbon footprint, wasn't there? Didn't see really anything on legal. So, you know, if you just did Pestel and we counted up how many points we got there, I think we probably got one, two, um, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, which probably is cutting it a bit thin. So I'm going to then think, well, I need to get some more marks. If I've got seven, there's 15 marks available. Seven's cutting it a bit fine. So I'm going to go through what Five Forces tells us. And I'm going to say, is there a threat from new entrants? Well, when I do threat from new entrants, I don't just think, oh, is there a threat from new entrants? Threat from new entrants are determined by barriers to entry. So in your technical knowledge that you're able to regurgitate, you think capital cost, economies of scale, differentiation, legal, access to distribution channels, switching costs. And you understand those things. And you consider, are they an issue in the scenario? But you don't mention them all, but you use them to work through in your mind to see any of them are relevant in the scenario. So here, I think, is there any barriers to entry? Is capital cost an issue? Well, it is, yes. It, the capital cost is quite high. Are there any legal barriers? Do you need a license to do uh, IT components? No. Is economies of scale relevant? Yes, it is. And there's a couple of players which are massive. Yep. And there's massive economies of scale. Differentiation, uh, does that come in? Not really. Uh, it doesn't seem that people are that bothered about that. Distribution channel access, couldn't really see anything. Switching costs, I couldn't see anything. So when I go through barriers to entry, I go through that whole list. Didn't really mention more than a couple of them,
but the fact that I had the list enabled me to do what I did. Yeah, so that would be uh, an important way of approaching it. So just to remind you, capital cost was high, um, switching costs, and then I would move on and I would think, what about um, suppliers? Yeah, do they have power? Well, in the scenario, yes, they do. 50% from two big suppliers. So, so what? Well, because they control things, they have power, they can charge high prices, they can, you know, cause problems for us. We don't have choice. We have to do what they say. So that's a problem. Um, what about customers? Well, um, you know, the, in the data components, they've only got 1%. So they're not really um, got much going on there. Whereas in the other markets, what they do is more bespoke components. So therefore, maybe they do that. Maybe those customers don't have quite so much power because you're in charge. Yep. Is there evidence of substitutes? Not that I could really see. Uh, what about competitive rivalry? Well, we're not really very big. So do I use Pestel? Do I use Five Forces? To be honest, probably use a combination of both. OK, so there is a summation of a question. Maybe let me give you, I don't know, five, 10 minutes to have a cup of tea to reflect on that. Ask, think of some questions on what I've said, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at your questions. I'm going to discuss them. And um, maybe we might have a look at another question again. So I'm going to come back. Um, I'm going to start at John, who says, how do I differentiate between political and legal? And I'm going to go through the other questions. So um, I'll give you um, a, a short comfort break. Uh, it's uh, 33. Let's see if we can get back by uh, 3.40. Yeah, so about a seven minute break. Yeah, just to, I mean, if, if we finish a bit earlier, great, but it gives me the opportunity to answer as many questions as possible, which for all you live attendees is what you're here for. So maybe quick comfort break, quick glass of water or whatever, and then I'll be back in about seven, eight minutes. Okay.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, you can see and hear me okay? Lots of questions, fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna work through them. Um, so John uh, wants to know, uh, how do you exactly differentiate between political and legal? Well, in most situations, I suppose it depends where you live, um, and how democratic it is, but normally um, there will be uh, a close connection between politics and legal, but um, if there is a potential change in a political situation, that would obviously potentially affect our external environment, and we need to be aware of that. There would be different policies maybe on tax and on investment, whereas legal are things we must comply with. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that helps. Uh, Chai says, for the legal. I'm, um, I'm not sure what you mean by for the legal. Uh, there is a, for, oh, for the legal, there is a significant employment legislation setting minimum wage and conditions. Can I use this as a point? Uh, potentially, yes, you can, yes. Uh, I mean, I might have missed some. I was just, uh, can we use a combination? Um, a combination of what you, sorry, well, there's lots of questions coming through and uh, it's really important. I'm not sure what you mean, Madeline. Can we use combination, combination of what? Uh, Brenda, I don't know that we are able to use combination framework. I didn't know. Oh, sorry, I think I know what you mean. Can we use Pestel or Five Forces? You could use Porter's Diamond. You could use whatever you want. Yep. The point of the models is they're there to stimulate thinking. They're not there to be marked in themselves. That's an important point, so fantastic. Um, yes, it is possible. It's about the external environment. These are just techniques we can use to help us. Well, Pestel is really a model that we use for our external environment. Five Forces is a, a model we use to understand competition. That's how it is, Chai. Um, is marking based on one mark per point, possibly two marks per point, that is elaborated upon? Go back to the slide, Daniel, and that's exactly what I said in the slide. I don't know whether you're just arriving, but we, we mentioned it in a slide. Yes, that should be what you aim for. Can you explain the the re relative re relation between switching costs and bargaining power supplier a switching cost is a cost incurred not by the new entrant but by existing players in the market so if apple brought out a computer when they did and everyone had a microsoft the switching cost wouldn't only be buying the computer but would be changing all my microsoft software to apple software because obviously they, they have a different operating system. So that's what a switching cost is. A bargaining power of a supplier is if the supplier is concentrated and on a monopoly and they can screw us on price. And the same if there's only one or two customers, again, they can screw us on price because if we don't accept their price, we're gonna lose most of our business. Um, Brenda's saying, if we could use English, but not business English. Um, well, there, there is a subtle difference, Brenda. Business English is what's used in business. This is a strategic business analysis exam. I would recommend that you become familiar with business English. All of the articles written on ACCA Insights are all written in more business English. It's slightly different. So um, it's not that there is a, you know, a real clear it's just the way and the tone and the flow. Uh, so please try to become familiar with it. Yeah, that's what you have to do in the workplace. The exam is providing you with preparation for the workplace. Um, Shabadeen, what if there is more than 10 points for 15 mark question? Are we expected to cover all of it or only the main eight points? Well, you're expected to cover as many as you can in the time, uh, Shabadeen. I would encourage you to go for all 15, but I'm a realist, and sometimes it might not be possible to do that in the time allocated. But we do need to be moving, if it's a 15-mark question, at least over eight points. Okay, and I would encourage you to separate those points. 
crystal. Actually, I couldn't. What is the difference between English and business English? Could you please elaborate? Well, crystal, uh, it's a subtle difference, but it is the tone, the phrase, the way if you read business articles regularly, which I'm sure if you're a serious candidate for SPL, you are reading, um, you will know the difference. Um, yep. Um, how much elaboration is required to explain a point? Well, you know, um, a verb and adjective, a conclusion would get you up to two marks, Vignesh. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't stress the importance of you getting proper to time mock exams marked. Yep, you really need to find a way of making sure that happens. Uh, you didn't read the BPP textbook for every page. Thank goodness for that, Nor. Why on earth would you do that? I just made my own notes. That's very good. Fantastic. Uh, yes, it is. The BPP, I think of a BPP textbook as a dictionary. So when you learned to speak English, did you read every page of the dictionary? I don't think you did. Yeah. Um, it, it's not really going to help you. It's there as a reference. So if when you're going through the main syllabus areas and, and hopefully you've got some kind of summary notes. Uh, I think to create the summary notes, you might have had to have skimmed most of those pages, uh, but hopefully you've had a tutor that can help you with that. So hopefully that answers your question, Nor. So what do we do when we have done a question two time and maybe got some marked feedback on it? OK, well, we reflect on what we did. OK, we review how we approached it and we have a look at whether how we approached it could be improved upon and what could be improved upon. We need to make a note to self. Yep. But what we can also reassure ourselves with is that by doing a question to time and getting some marked feedback on that question to time, we are now one step closer to passing this exam. OK, because we've actually had some third party input into how we're doing. It is so important. Yeah, I cannot stress it enough. Yeah, it's like taking your driving test. And practicing or it's taking your driving test and on the day of the test, you get into the car for the first time. Would you do that? Don't think you would. Yeah don't think you would. So this is really important that rather than read a chapter every day, that is not going to help you pass the exam. Yeah. So I've read a page of my, you know, I've watched lots of YouTube videos on how to pass my driving test. It's not going to help. Yeah, it's not going to help. You've got to get in the car and drive. You've got to get and do uh, some exams yourself. OK. All right, good, 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 good. Um, anything else before I move on? Okay, okay. I'll give you a minute. Okay, okay. Right, I'm going to have a look at another question um, from the DCS exam. And in this uh, question, um, it's a 12 mark question. How many marks would a 12 mark question uh, require us to spend on? Um, Madeline's doing 24. Where are you getting 24 from, Madeline? Lemon's coming up with 25. Cheers coming up with 20. Now Cheers saying 30. Kai saying two minutes a mark. Um, OK, uh, I mean, you know, if I'm honest, I'm. I'm, I'm not really I'm not saying you have to do a certain number of minutes, but if there's a 12 mark question 
and you're doing it in 20 minutes. I mean, respect, you must be a super fast reader. Um, yep. And, and, and as long as you know that and you've been practicing questions and you know you can read and interpret all of the requirements, all of the exhibits in 20 minutes, uh, big respect. Um, or, yeah, or, or is, I don't know, I'm not sure. But my, my point is, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to advise you that you need a structured approach to your time management. I would kind of agree with 30 minutes, but some of you might spend longer reading and therefore have less time delivering an answer. You have to practice to find out what is appropriate for you. 40 minutes reading and planning should be enough. Um, uh, John has said, is there any better way to capture the points instantly when we read exhibits? I think what I would be doing, John, when I'm practicing, I, I read the introduction of my case, I then read each of the tasks, and then I read each of the exhibits. And as I read exhibit one, I decide, having made a mental note of the tasks, exhibit one, ah, yes, that relates to question two. Exhibit two, that relates to question one and question two. Exhibit three, that's all on task three. Exhibit four and five are on task four and so on. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we, we have to reread and instantly forget. So I would have some kind of referencing between the tasks and the exhibits. You don't have to read all six again. Hopefully that helps. So um, 30 minutes, we write our start time, we write our finish time. Once I show you the question, we then, having seen the question, do a brainstorm and do a mark focus plan. So we do that every time. Um, there's also professional skills marks available for demonstrating analytical and evaluation skills. Again, I think exams going forward after the specimen one would not normally combine them in this way. You know, you get skills for skepticism, communication, one particular professional skill. So here we have it. We have, from the information you have collated, draft a section of a consultancy report for the directors of DCS to include the following. An evaluation of the overall performance of DCS between 2012 and 2015 from an integrated reporting perspective. Okay, so obviously, um, if you have actually read some modern day financial reports, you would see that they probably contain 30% finance. Yep, the other 70% is talking about governance, social responsibility, how they help their staff, and those kind of reports are reflective of what's known as an integrated report. So if you actually tune into the world around you, you would be, I hope, relatively comfortable what integrated reporting um, is all about. Yeah, um, there is something academically um, on integrated reporting, which talks about, if I did a brainstorm, uh, the six capitals. Now, you can use the six capitals, but personally, I wouldn't. I'm familiar with reading reports. Yeah. So, and I, I don't, you know, I try to see things in a practical way as opposed to an abstract academic way. Yeah. But you could use the six capitals. That would be absolutely fine. Um, and we would think, well, a good integrated report would tend to address the six capitals. What we have to do here is look at DCS. We talk about the finances. So, you know, you talk about net profit margin, you talk about revenue growth. If we were talking about people, what kind of things in an integrated report would we talk about people? Uh, maybe you might. Um, I think you would look at how I think what actually what I'm going to do here, I'm going to uh, I'm just going to go online for one second just to show you it's so important that we are able to do this. So I'm going to go to 
Tesco annual report. Um, so we look at their Tesco annual. It's really important that you are familiar um, with this. So here's Tesco. Can you see the screen, by the way? Are, are you seeing the Tesco? No. OK, 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 OK. Um, OK, OK. Let me just have a look. Um, I'm, I'm going to just stop sharing, and I'm going to share again. Which screen am I going to share? I'm going to share this screen. So I'm thinking you can. I'm going to put the chat box up because the chat box is gone. I'm thinking you could. Can you see the Tesco screen now? Yes. OK, good, good. So let me expand that so you can see it. So what we have here, we have the Tesco annual report. You can see it is, you know, nearly 200 pages long. There is maybe, uh, yeah, there's there's kind of 50 pages on um, the the, the um, financials. But if we go through it, you need to familiarise yourself with decent company annual reports. So what do they report on? Well, they should be really. They don't say human capital, financial capital, manufactured capital, but they talk about their business model. Yeah. They uh, talk a bit about a financial review. So what's happening uh, financially? So they do that. Uh, so that's obviously important. Sorry, I've just literally opened this up, but it's bound to be, looks at their KPIs. So it's not just financial, uh, it's sales, it's cash flow, it's colleagues recommend us as a great place to work. Um, group sales, uh, retail cash flow. And then it does a risk overview. So integrated reporting would look at robust risk and it talks about risk identification, risk mitigation. Okay, so we look at that. What are the risks and uh, how do we deal with those risks? It looks at uh, what, you know, so technology, has that risk moved? What are the mitigating factors for that risk? Data security, has it moved? So it's identified and it is addressed how we deal with the risks. It talks about people, uh, it talks about Brexit, it talks about the bank. So lots of stuff there. Longer term viability, uh, it talks about climate change. So what are we doing on that? And then um, our approach to helping shoppers. So our key shoppers talks about people, products, planet and places. So um, that is obviously a take on um, triple bottom line, isn't it? People, planet and profit. You may be familiar with that. Uh, so it talks. So it talks about what they do with their people, planet, and pro so slightly different to what they've done before there. This statement's fairly, there's a letter from the chairman. So the chairman will say, I've looked at everything, having an effective corporate governance framework, and I've checked and I've looked at the risk and it's all okay, signed the chairman. Yep. So the chairman has committed to say what's in the accounts he believes is okay. And therefore, he potentially is liable because he signed that and he's not going to sign things unless he's confident. There's then lots on corporate governance. OK, so my point is, I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to go back to. Um, my point is that. I'm going to put the chat back. So we, we could see, we could see good, good, good. My point, have you ever seen a proper company report like that? Have you ever read one? So John has, and which ones do you read? Well, you read it for SBR, but you just look at the figures on that SBR. Anyone got a favorite? AirAsia. Okay, I'm not familiar with AirAsia, but thanks, John. I'll have a look. I mean... You know, corporate governance wasn't invented, but certainly was um, was pioneered by, you know, Cadbury and the UK code. And if you're looking at businesses quoted on the UK stock exchange, they tend to have very high standards 
and they're, they're worth a look. And Tesco is a supermarket in your country. It is quoted on the UK Stock Exchange. Have a look and just see how they bring the six capitals to life. Yeah. Rather than, it's a bit like, you know, oh, I'm practicing my driving test, what you're doing, oh, I'm watching videos of people driving. Go and practically experience what real companies do and see how they put it together. Look at the remuneration and benefits report. Look at what it includes. Look at how uh, each of the NEDs are on different committees. Look how it mentions all of that will just rub off on you. You don't need to learn it. You just become familiar with that's how businesses behave. Yeah. So I, I think if you can be more practical, it's going to help you in your understanding. And when you're confident in your understanding, you can talk with more confidence about what's going on. Does that make sense? Any questions on what I've said there? John says, is integrated report a compulsory question? Um, there is no compulsory questions, John. Integrated reporting, as I've shown, is how most of the leading companies in the world, in the UK at least, would quote that the second biggest stock exchange in the world is London. Um, and yes, that's how they would report their behaviors. So we should be familiar with it. Is it a compulsory question? No, but it's reflective of what companies do. So you should understand what integrated reporting is. If you don't know what integrated reporting is, I'm not sure you're ready to pass becoming an accountant. That's how the ACCA would see it. It's all around you. You should be digesting, living and breathing this kind of thing. Okay. I'm not saying spend all your time on in integrated reporting. You may have read in a textbook six capitals of that, which is fine. But, you know, what do they mean? Do you know? Uh, hopefully by reading and seeing it in real life, you could relate to it much better. I, I wouldn't even use that if I was, I just know what a typical integrated report covers. If you need some guidance, that's a very useful way of guiding. Yeah. Any other questions on integrated reporting there? For you, it's a live event. Um, it, it's it's your event. So I've got, um, you know, as I said yesterday, I've got about two one hour sessions of chat and I've left about half an hour at least for you to ask me questions. Um, whether you want to use those or not, that's up to you, but I recommend you do. OK. All right. Great, great, great. Let's continue. So we need to evaluate that in the context of DCS. Um, we've got six capitals. We've got, uh, you, you know, um, how does integrated reporting address each one? 12 marks. Roughly try to get a couple of marks on each capital. Uh, that's if you want 100%. You don't need 100%. But that would be my plan for dealing with a question of that nature. OK. Right. All right. If you've got no questions, I will move on. I will move on. Um, oh, my goodness. Nor do I think integrated reporting will come out on this this December? Um, well, is it relevant to business? Of course it is, Nor. So um, this this at the strategic professional level, you need to have a general understanding of quite a bit. Yeah, if you're relying, uh, and some tutors still do that because that's what students want, but let me tell you, um, the same kind of themes come up virtually every time. Uh, what's coming up? What's a tip? Oh, it's going to be corporate social responsibility. It's going to be integrated. It, it doesn't work like that. And I'm sorry to disappoint you. I think it is relevant and you should know it. It's not a question of which five do I learn in detail. It's having an awareness of all things really that the diet looks at, but not in much detail, having an, a holistic overview. Yep. 
um, well, I'm going to throw it back. We, we're talking about manufactured capital. Uh, I mean, again, that's why I don't like really talking about the six capitals because it's a little bit abstract. Um, and, um, you, you know, it, it's, it, it's what, it's just too abstract for me, but what would, what would, let me throw it back to the audience. What do you see as manufactured capital? It's just a bit formal. That's why I would much rather you chair actually read a real report. Can anyone else give me a, an example of manufactured capital? What would you say on manufactured capital? Uh, property plant and equipment, yes, but <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so, but but so what? what? What what are we looking at on manufactured capital? What what's the relevance of looking at it? Why why are we talking about this to shareholders? So it's because it's using. Yes, it is. But why why you need to understand why. Okay, and what? How would it help? So I'm a taxi firm in KL, and I'm using 20-year-old uh, Proton Sagas for my taxi. What do you think? Is that good? So my manufactured capital will be 220 years old Proton Sagas. Old car, low fuel efficiency. You might be getting um, green taxes coming in, which will make those uh, assets no longer relevant. Yeah, they're not efficient. Miles per gallon pollution capacity, you know, maintenance cost. Exactly. So that's why shareholders want to know about manufactured capital. They want to know whether the company has future potential. So, you know, if you read the Tesco report, it will talk about, you know, we've invested in the latest technology for delivery and et cetera. But if you think um, money market capital is those assets involved in the production of the thing, it's like, what does that mean? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of relating and making it understandable to you. Yeah. So, yeah. Why, uh, how PPP will give. Yeah. Makes sense. But I, I would also be a little bit reluctant to say PPE. I would, you know, talk about the um, stuff in the context of, of the company. Uh, can we link manufacturing and financial capital? You're going to have to explain, John. I, I don't know why you would want to. They probably, they all link, all six do link together in terms of how they provide shareholder value. But I don't quite understand the question, John, why? No, okay, uh, I'm not getting an answer. Maybe it's a bit slow. Maybe we'll come back to that one. Um, okay, so we've looked at another question. When we look at a question, what do I want you to do? I want you to reflect on how you did. I want you to review your answer and think about did your answer, you know, did it did it, did it fall short in some areas? And wherever it fell short or where it did well, write a note to self and Remember, another question, another step closer to passing the exam. OK, so two questions there. What did we learn from having a go at those questions? What I mean, you tell me what you learned about those questions. Answer planning, but don't over plan, Daniel. Practical application. Thank you, Vignesh. You know, I, I, I want you to be human. You're in the workplace. Time management is crucial. In order for you to really understand that, though, you have to practice the time. 
Yeah, brain dumping of knowledge, Brenda, will not only be unprofessional, it won't get you any marks and it will waste the marker's time and you want the marker to love you. Okay. Um, model doesn't matter. Apply to the context is important. Great. Taking mock exams to practice. Yes. And getting mark feedback, Kai. Apply technical knowledge and answer based on the requirements. Thank you, Lucas. It's not regurgitation. Straight to the point, but not bullet points, uh, Heidel. Okay, okay. Good stuff, good stuff. All right. Um, I just, what, let me just share, let me see if I can share something on timing with you. I just need to plug something in because I think it is quite an important point to get across. Um, so just bear with me if the technology works here. I hope it does. Um, so I just want to add something about timing. Um, so just bear with me and I'm going to see where this comes up. Um, right, uh, I just have to I have to just move a few screens. I'm using a separate machine here. So just bear with me one second. I just need to escape. Uh, why is that not working? Escape from that. Um, I'm going to go here. I'm going to do file, new movie recording. Okay, I need to stop sharing that screen, share a new screen. This screen here. Just need to put the chat panel back up. Okay, so can you see on the screen? Uh, a kind of lined piece of paper. Yes. John, uh, can you come back to me on Balogun, Hope and Haley? Um, um, so what happens, this is something I did with the examining team a few years ago. And it was when we were looking at ACCA paper three and we did, uh, reviewed student performance in an exam. And back then there was a 50 mark question and there was two 25 mark questions. So it took three hours. So it was 90 minutes for the first 50 mark. It was 45 minutes for the second and 45 minutes for the third. And what students should do is question one, their mark score per minute would go there. This would be then 90 minutes. And then they stop because it's 90 minutes. They do, so that was question one. They then do question two. This is then 45 minutes later, 135. And then they do 180 and that's question three. And, and that's great. That is an exam you can see that as we go down here, the mark score slight. So the first 50% of the marks are going to be easier to achieve than the second 50%. Are you with me? Let's check the chat box is, is okay. Right, so this is at 90 minutes. But however, some students answering a question and they, they start and they do as this black line does, they do and they do, but I can say a little bit more. So they say a little bit more and then they stop here. Okay, so they've gone over time. And whilst they were going over on time, the actual mark per minute score was down here, where if they left there and went there, their mark per minute score would be up here. Okay, an important point. But that would therefore be their question one. What they then do, is they start the next question, question two, and probably get to a point, ah, I can say a little bit more, say a little bit more, and then they start question three. Unfortunately, time is now up. 
So if they followed the black line, they would answer they would answer 100 of the marks and they need to get 50 which equals a relatively easy 50 percent okay however the pink student they only answered 75 of the marks yep they still need to get 50 50 out of 75 is 67 percent and you're putting yourself in a situation there that is very very difficult yep can you see how important time management is crystal asks me a question do you mean when time is up no matter we finish answer the question or not we have to jump to the second question yes i do crystal because otherwise you only f allow yourself to answer 75 of the marks and that puts you in a situation where you've got 67 percent to get the problem with that is the following if i was to show you when all the scores are in and we have a normal distribution of marks you're probably going to have 50 55 60 45 40 but not you wanting you're over here so that's you know one two you're over three standard deviations away i mean that's a superstar performer if you really think you are a superstar performer well approach this way but even then you're only going to be um getting a bare pass Vivian, it's about getting marks. It's not about being beautiful. Let me say this to drive the point home. Your exam is a project management exercise in mark acquisition. You need to get over 50 marks okay you need to get over 50 marks and you do not need to be worrying about doing beautiful conclusions you need to get over 50 marks yep so vivian said should i write a closing paragraph you need to get out of there within a minute or two if you can do a closing paragraph in a minute or two fine but you're, you're trying to acquire marks. The other problem is you can see as we spend longer, the mark score per minute diminishes. So we need to be making sure we are hitting these high points. Does it affect the professional marks? <sighs> well, <laughs> It, it, professional marks are about do you address the correct tone or do you use so if it's asking about skepticism is the way in which you put your answer together one of probing questioning and challenging if you know you only do one slide but you do do slides with supporting notes you'll get most of the marks yeah that's how professional marks would be awarded so not massively if you follow the requirements of the professional marks correctly Uh, it's the way exams are set, Daniel. Marks per minute should always diminish. Exams, the first 50, you know, the way you design an exam, the first 50 marks, there will be some achievable marks and it gets progressively more difficult. You know, nobody gets 100% on SPL. I've had a few global prize winners and they've got um, maybe high 80s. Yeah, but you need to get 50. It's not about that. You need to get more than 50. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose this screen share if you don't. I'll give you one minute.
Okay, okay. Okay, okay, let me just put that. So I think um, I want to talk about what you need to do in the next few weeks. Yep. So what do we need to do in the next few weeks? Um, the one thing I'm, you know, some people will be suffering from and is worth talking about. Firstly, just let me check because I've been moving screens. Can you see a slide with session structure on it? Great. Thank you. I just thought I'd check just in case. Um, OK, I did want to talk about mental health. Um, Many people have been under a lot of stress during lockdown, not being able to interact with their work colleagues, not speaking to people, not being able to go outside. And it has had a pretty big impact on many people's mental health, and I'm sure on some of yours. So what I want to draw your attention to is that the ACCA on their website do have uh, comprehensive support um, to keep your mental health in good condition. Yep. So have a look on the website. You might not know it's available, but it's a really good resource. Um, there's a video on worry. There's uh, also a video on confidence. OK, and these videos have been recorded um, by psychologists employed by the ACCA to help you. Yep. So if you're not familiar with them, they're really good videos. If you're struggling a bit with your mental health, you're stressed, they give good advice on what to do. I think I mentioned uh, yesterday uh, also that um, we, we can just, it, a bit like exercising our physical body, exercising our mental body. If you have an app, um, Spotify, I think if you just have if you have the family one, it's a bit different. And I think you have to pay a, a few dollars. But if you have, you can get access to a, an app called Headspace, which a lot of people find useful. And what that is, it's just kind of mental fitness. Yeah, it's keeping your brain where it needs to be, because, um, you know, we, we need to look after that, because if we're getting stressed and worried, our brains are going to become hijacked by stress chemicals, which are no good at all to our ability to um, study as effectively as we can. So I just wanted to, um, you know, talk about mental health because it, it, it's really, really relevant at all times, but especially relevant in this current pandemic where, you know, it, we, we kind of have all kinds of things being thrown at us, which can cause a lot of stress. So, um, you know, there's resources there to help you um, re really have a look at that. I think it's really useful. And even if you don't think you have any mental health issues, um, I, you know, it's, it's in the same way you think you, you, you're fit. Well, even if you're fit, you would still do exercise. Yeah, it's just good for your body to regularly exercise. And I think it's good for your brain to do and go through some of the things suggested in these videos. So I'll leave that for you to look at. But if you are struggling, if you are worried, that's quite useful. What else um, do I want you to do? Well, I want you to read my articles on exam preparation in the student accountant. OK, I've spent a lot of time writing these and uh, these articles and there are other articles that are not just written by me. But I, I, I think it's important for us to be carried through that we are clear on why we are doing these exams. What do we want to do them for? Yeah. Um, what? Why? Why? What's it going to bring to you? I've got a red Ferrari. I'm not saying everyone wants a red Ferrari and for some that might be materialistic. But in order for us to um, put in the effort to channel our energy, we really need to um, 
we really need to have a clear goal. If we don't have a clear goal, it can be quite difficult to motivate ourselves. So if you really do want that red Ferrari, um, you put a picture of it on your wall. Um, yep, um, that is what this effort is hopefully going to pay off for. Yep, hopefully. Yep, but um, creating pictures, creating visuals is a great way of making you get out of bed in the morning. It's a reason for living. Yeah. So, you know, when people have a reason for living, even in the most tragic, you know, I was reading some stories about refugees and just that awful, their children all being killed and all the rest of it. But the lady, because she was pregnant with another child, she, you know, she didn't give up on life because she had a reason for living. Well, your reason for living, yes, pass the exam. But I think you have to translate that into a more personal goal of why you want to pass this exam and you need to write it down. You need to tell people about it. Yep, that's how, you know, you're going to keep going and keep motivated. Um, also talking in an article, I've written about six articles, so they all link together if you go on. Um, but, um, you know, you, you have to actually articulate more than I want to pass. We talked about creating a visual also talk about creating a study timetable, really important. Um, you also need to keep your brain active and get study fit. I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, things that you can do. Um, the things I talked to you about were, when do you work? You work when you're in a state of flow, when you know you work best. Um, Sorry, you work, you know, when you have to work, sometimes it depends on your employer. But if you have flexibility, think about that. When do you study? So the point on work is, you know, you've got to say to your boss, look, I've got exams in a few weeks. I need to allocate some of my time to study. Obviously, you pay my salary. But can we agree that I work within these times? And would you mind until December X, I um, you know, spend the, the time studying when I'm not working. And then after that date, I can happily do a little bit more work for you. Yep. Um, think about when you study, when you're in the state of flow. I do think exercise is a good thing because exercise creates endorphins. Um, and they are chemicals that counterbalance stress chemical of cortisol. And you also need to put into that diary relaxation and fun. That's a reward for the extra work you've put in. Brenda wants to know of how long should we allocate for study in a day? Um, it, I, well, I would break it down to not days. I would break it down to minutes, Brenda. And um, I think I mentioned to you um, about the Pomodoro technique. Um, I'll, I'll mention it. I think I've got a slide on it. So I'll, I'll mention it in a moment. So when do you work? When do you study? when do you exercise and when you relax. All of those need to be programmed. If you haven't got a timetable of when those are happening, well, um, you know, it's not going to happen. OK. So really important. Uh, what else? Um, well, all of that links to what I would describe as having a plan. OK, so we have got a clear plan of what we do and, and when we do it. Um, and if we've got that plan, well, uh, really important. Uh, you also need to look after number one at the moment and prioritize your tasks. Um, what is important? Well, uh, it is important to pass the exam. I think I mentioned to you yesterday about the Ivy Lee method, where people prepare a to-do list at the end of the day. And so when they start in the morning, they know that they've thought about the six tasks they need to achieve the next day. Yeah, write down a list, which you want to compete is, is a useful thing. Um, you also, we also talked yesterday about how we're different as opposed to when we perform well. You know, are we a morning person? Are we an evening person? Do we like to study with food or without food? Um, that kind of thing. Um, Get yourself a routine. The reason I want you to get a routine is it creates a habit. If you have a habit, it makes it a lot easier to do things. Yep. Um, and that habit will be reinforced by going to bed at the same time, by getting up at the same time. Yep. 
It will help you get good sleep um, and help your brain and help you study. Talked about state of flow. Obviously, that's important when we're in a state of flow. Um, when uh, we study with deadlines, that also helps us. So that helps us commit to something. Yep, and uh, miniature deadlines, um, I suppose, are linked to time management techniques. Um, that, that I'll talk about that in a moment. But in terms of deadlines, when are you going to do an exam to time? Yep. And who's going to mark it? You've got to get that in the diary. Yeah, it's, it's not about I'm not ready, I'm not ready. The whole point of doing an exam to time is to evaluate areas of weakness so we can learn from them. It doesn't matter what your score is. What matters is you learn from the experience. Yeah, really important that you do that. Um, also, time management techniques. Uh, so someone said, how long do I study? The, the technique I mentioned yesterday, I think, was the Pomodoro technique. And uh, this is an app you can get on your phone. And it kind of breaks the uh, day into, I think it starts off with um, 25 minutes, then a five minute break, 25 minutes and a five minute break. But you don't have time to go on social media, which of course you're gonna switch off. Yeah, it's 25 minutes focus, then you have a break. 25 minutes focus, then you have a break. And that happens in four cycles, I think, and then you have a longer break. But there's someone controlling your behavior. And, you know, phones are very good and you can adjust it, you know, um, if you get better. But to begin with, our attention span is going to struggle beyond 25 minutes. So that's important. Um, also, you, you know, I know we've got the Ferrari coming to us in time, but often we detach ourselves from those long term awards and we need to have short term awards. So short term awards will be, you know, you've got things in the diary that you're going to do. And that's why it's worth putting the effort in now. Yeah. So um, reward yourself. What else do I uh, suggest? Well, focus on your energy levels and, um, you know, how do we uh, do that? Uh, well, I mean, nutrition is important. Hydration is important. Uh, exercise is important. Food is important. Um, they're all, you know, the whole self for you to do well in your exams. Um, think about playing energizing music uh, to change your mood. Think about where uh, you do your study. What does it look like? Is it a mess? If it's a mess, we're going to be distracted. Is your phone turned on? Turn it off. Is other social media turned on? Turn it off. Yeah, it, it, it's a massive drain on your brain, the distractions of social media. Uh, if it's really that important and you, or you are a social media influencer with millions of followers, we'll pay someone to do it for you. If you want to pass your exam, turn it off. OK, really important. Um, and then just, re, you know, have you thought about exercise and diet? Do you have it programmed in? The issue is if you eat kind of uh, processed white flour carbohydrates, they move through your system uh, very quickly and they, they give you a massive like uh, kind of sugar rush. Your body can't handle all that sugar. It converts it into glycogen and that makes you sleepy. Yeah. So we need to have slow release carbohydrates that don't all get converted at once. They take longer to and we don't get that big dump. Yeah. Think about things that are helpful to uh, help with, you know, nuts are good for our brain. So look at brain food. You can research the different brain foods. Um, think about just looking after yourself. You're going to be stressed. You're going to be burning things more than normal. So think about maybe vitamin supplements just to keep you in tip top condition. Yep. Um, so that's important. Um, and we also talked yesterday about when are we thinking of implementing these ideas? Anybody got any ideas when you're going to implement these ideas? Now, thank you, John. Okay. And maybe tell people, tell people you're going to do them. Put it on the wall so, so you can be held accountable by others. Yeah, 
what you're going to do. Only two of you are going to do it now. So the rest of you think it's a good idea, but maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I might do it in the next few weeks. Well, I've got news for you. Your exam is in the next few weeks. You need to do it now. Uh, if you're serious, if you're not serious, don't study, go and have fun. Okay. But either study and pass this exam or go and have fun. But to not do 100% to ensure you pass this exam is not the best use of your time. Yeah. So what I hope you're going to do is start today. Yeah. You're going to break study and life into manageable chunks. Yeah. You're going to help your mental health by looking at those recommendations I've suggested. Uh, have a little mind space podcast to listen to for half an hour a day. Spend a little bit of time just reflecting and clearing and draining out your brain of all the stresses. It's really going to help. Yeah, you're going to also help yourself with exercise and diet. OK. And what you're also going to do is you're going to make sure it's very clear what the prize is. What's the reward? What is this going to do for your life? Picture it. Smell it, taste it. This is going to be yours if in the next few weeks you just do and follow a few simple things. And if you do that, you're going to be really successful in your exam. Right, that is pretty much what I want to say. Do you have any questions on anything at all? Um, so Yappa said, do you think there's enough time to study SPL? I also spend time on exercising. Well, the fact is, Yap, when you put time in the diary for exercising, you really focus on the time in the diary you have for studying because you've got other things to do. And, and there's a saying, if you want to get something done, find a busy person, because a busy person is very good at juggling and organizing and getting things done. Yep. Uh, Balogun, Hope and Haley, what, what, I mean, it's just a model, um, John, what, what do you want to know about it? Well, first of all, what I would ask you what the model is, if you're bringing up the model, Balogun, Hope and Haley is about contextual. So change is dependent or contextual on what? How much time do we have? What is the scope of the change and so on? So it's useful on a change question. But again, I would never mention it. Would you mention that at work? No one would know what you're talking about. But it is a good framework to answer questions where it's talking about, you know, what would change be dependent on? Definitely um, reading technical articles on the website would help. I've written a couple of articles, technical ones, on the strategic planning process, which if you're a little bit uncertain about all the steps in strategic planning, have a look um, at how we integrate analysis choice. So strategic planning process, part one, strategic planning process. part. I actually wrote that originally for uh, the... Oh, years ago, actually, I think even P12, I updated it for P3 and it's now updated for SPL. And the reason it's still there is so many people read it and find it useful. Yeah, because ACCA can see the analytics of how many. So that, that's a really good exam. Uh, put my name in strategic planning process. It's going to help. John's come back. When do we need to know that model? Well, the question will ask about, you know, the uh, change, John. Um, it's just another useful framework to help organize your memory in the same way the cultural web. Do we need to know the cultural web? No, you don't. But if you do know the cultural web, it will help you have a checklist when looking at the cultural dynamics of a situation in a scenario. Uh, Feeds that in. OK, uh, I'm not sure where you've been the last three weeks. We have been uh, promoting this video for the last three weeks, um, but you can get it. Yep, no problem. Um, and you can get it on recording, but please organize, get things in the diary so you get things done. Huda, 
Um, why in the ACC web don't publish any actual 2019 exam papers? Um, well, they, they are representative of what they should be. I mean, that's what they do, Huda. Uh, there's lots of practice, there's specimen papers, there's September, there's December, uh, there's a, a sample from uh, March, June, and from September, December. That's a lot, that's enough. Have you done them all? You know, you're moaning that they don't publish them. Have you done them all to time? If you have, well, maybe you can have a conversation with the ACCA. If you've done them all to time, all the ones available and had them all marked, fantastic. You're well on the way to passing. So focus on what you can do. Yep, focus on passing the exam. What is the appropriate method to start studying now, which the time limited in preparing uh, well, you know, you should, the study should now definitely be a strong habit, Crystal, um, and you should be studying relatively hard. You will be making sacrifices in your life if you're a serious student. You'll have a timetable that keeps you working. Can you brief the project initiation document format? What should be included? Well, a project initiation document is something we put forward. It would normally talk about uh, who's on the project. I mean, you need to know a general overview and a question of it come on project initiation document might ask you to comment on it. So what, what do you think about the project initiation document? I think there was one in specimen two. And you'd say, well, it's OK, but there's nothing about the sponsor. There's nothing about the manager. There's no milestones. Uh, there's nothing about time or milestones. Uh, there's nothing about scope. So you just need to know what a good one looks like and then look at the scenario. And it will normally be a bad one or it will be, all be asking you to what include in a good one. Crystal says, what I do now is keep on practice questions. The same question I may practice 15 times. Is that right? Um, mm, I'm not sure. Would it be good for me? I get in the car every day and I stall it. I don't have a driving instructor. I don't have anyone giving me feedback. Am I practicing for driving correctly? That would be my question back to you, Crystal. I don't know how you are assessing how you are doing. You, it's good to get someone to give you marked feedback would be my advice. Really important that you know that your layout could be improved, uh, that your sentences aren't long enough. Uh, that's really important. Is it necessary to watch the pass exam debrief on the ACCA website? What do you think, Yap? Do they do, they do it to help students or they do it just to for a bit of fun. They do it to help you. It's there to help you. I've recorded those debriefs. Have a look at them. Um, I also send out things to students. Some of you, I know, sign up uh, to get emails from me. If you drop me an email or look at my website, seanpurcell.co.uk, uh, happy to send you stuff. Just tell me what you would like. Um, but that's up to you, you know. Um, but the ACCA does have good debriefs on their website as well. So I've seen a question regarding big data, request us to give the benefit in one question and another one is opportunity. How to answer? Well, you need to understand, Brenda, what big data is. It's not big data is volume, velocity, variety, and a new word, veracity. That doesn't mean anything. Big data, what does it do? Well, going back to Tesco, big data helps Tesco understand what customers are buying, when they're buying, how many come at what time of the day. Yeah, do they respond to special offers? Do they respond for two for one? What day do people buy this? What day do people buy that? How much do they spend on a Monday? How much do they spend on a Friday? You can use that to analyze and service customers much better. So try to always practically relate it, Brenda, I would say. Can you do me a favor to mark my answer? Crystal, I, if you want to, I do through another website, but that's not why I'm here. I do do uh, stuff, but you have a, you know, contact me on LinkedIn and, and have a look. Uh, I do that for, for lots of students who all pass, yeah, uh, because I make sure they, they do review, uh, uh, do do marked answers. So, and, and, you know, but that's outside the remit of this webinar. This is for the ACCA to help you pass your exam. Faizatin, I have difficulty to answer with skepticism. Any tips? Well, don't, don't take things at face value. Um, Yep. Um, question, probe, challenge. Where does that figure come from? Is it valid? Um, 
Crystal, on the initial, the, the, my links should be somewhere on the ACCA, seanpurcell.co.uk. Uh, you'll find me there. Any other worries that we're having? Brenda says, do we have the opportunity to keep connect with you after this webinar? You found the workshop really helpful. Um, Brenda, what you can do, I, I can create, I can put you on a, a mailing list where I'll, I'll send you things the ACCA are saying. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I might give a, a regular newsletter saying, look, this is important. Have you seen this article? Um, and, and may, yeah, okay. If you're asking, I, I wasn't intended, but Brenda, you've asked me, I will commit to doing something. Um, maybe uh, tr try and find me on LinkedIn or, or find me seanpurcell.co.uk. Um, and I, I'll, I'll post some stuff for you and anyone else that can find benefit from it. So mainly just reminders of what you need to do. I just think we, you know, we need a coach, don't we? So I'll try and be your coach for the next few weeks. Um, but, uh, for making it easy for me to connect with you, I have to do it through a, a kind of a mass mail, you know, something like LinkedIn for me to individually contact all 180 of you every few days is, is really not very practical from my perspective, but I, I'm happy to have a go. Um, where can I get the examiner report for September 2020? Because ACCA has not yet published it. Um, I, well, I think they're publishing it in December, if I'm honest, no. Um, but I would say if you've read all the other examiner reports, you will know that the September report um, is not actually going to be um, any different to all the others, because I read every single one and they're pretty much the same every time in what students fail to do. So, um, yeah, good, good for mentioning the examiner reports. Please read them. Um, how do we sign up? Uh, yes, uh, yes, you, you connect with me there. Yep, I, and I, I can yeah, just tell me we had a chat and I promised that I was gonna give you some timely updates. So um, hey, you've made me do it and I, I'll, I'll stand by my word. So yeah. So summarizing what we've said, focus on the prize. We talked about uh, why SPL is taken as an exam. It's taken as an exam because it's a practical workplace related. We talked about the format, it's four hours, but if we manage our time, it's very achievable. It's not a regurgitation of knowledge, it's an application. People fail because of poor time management, not focusing on the marks, not having good layout and not reading the question. And I've talked about techniques you can use to overcome that. What do you need to do in the next few weeks? You need to get control of your life through timetables. You need to take advantage of the great opportunity you have got, which is enabling you to pass this exam. And you just need to maintain motivation. You need to maintain mental health. You need to maintain physical health and you need to maintain study fitness. OK, and we've talked about all of those. And to be honest, um, it's very achievable for all of you. Yeah, but you just need organization. And it's a bit like if you study till three in the morning, the next day you're tired. You need to have proper structure, which involves sleep, rest, relaxation and fun, as well as study. And if you do that and you look after the whole self, you will be successful, I promise you. OK, so it just leaves me to wish you all the very best of luck. I'm happy to share things on LinkedIn as you have requested me to do so. Um, but I would maybe watch this video again and um, reflect on what I've said. And we should be very grateful for the ACCA in Malaysia putting this on for you. You know, they care about you. They're there to serve you. Uh, I mean, you know, not every ACCA body is quite so proactive as yours is in Malaysia. So, you know, take advantage of what a great local office you have caring and wanting you to pass. So they want to look good uh, in that their students are passing. So please take on my advice, 
because that will make the ACCA in Malaysia look good and they will continue helping students moving forward to do the same. I wish you the very best of luck. Let's hope all of this pandemic and lockdown ends as soon as possible. And thank you and good luck. Thank you, everyone. I'm not sure when the recorded videos will be available, but I think very soon. OK, guys, um, thanks for your time. Thanks for your effort. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All the very best of luck.